Hi, everyone. Welcome to uh, yet another artist talk this semester. We're excited for you all to be here. Uh, my name is Justin Schmitz. I'm the photography instructor here at McHenry County College. Uh, we're delighted that you could sort of be here uh, to hear uh, Violet Lupzak uh, talk about the show that's up in the gallery and sort of give an uh, artist talk on what she's doing. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce uh, Violet. And then we're gonna get uh, we're gonna get started. So uh, thanks for taking the time out of your uh, schedule to be here. Uh, based in Chicago, Maya Lugzak holds an MFA from Cranbrook Academy of Art and her BA from Elmhurst University. Lugzak is currently Chicago art uh, is currently a Chicago Art Department resident and was previously a 2020 Talking Dolls resident in Detroit, Michigan. Uh, Lugzak has shown at various spaces, including but not limited to Jackson Young Gallery, Cleve Kearney Museum of Art, St. Louis Artist Guild, Woman Made Gallery, High Park Art Center, Wasserman Projects, Dragonfly Gallery, Mercedes Benz, Ann Arbor Art Center, Marriott W Hotel, and the Fulton Street Collective. Uh, Lugzak recently debuted her first solo show, An Utter Disaster at Talking Dolls in Detroit, Michigan in 2020. She has been published in New American Paintings, number 147, uh, MFA annual issue, Young Space, and It's Nice That. So without uh, further introduction, or without further ado, it's finals week, people. Uh, Via luck deck. thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you all for coming. I'm pretty excited to, to share some stuff with y'all today. Uh, thank you, Trevor, for getting this all set up and um, creating such a beautiful exhibition. Um, and just thank you for the rest of the art department for being so supportive um, and Daniela for also being so supportive. Okay, uh, so I'm going to take some time just to tell you a bit about myself uh, and my practice. Uh, as well as highlighting some of the work that is currently up in Gallery 1 and Gallery 2. If you haven't seen it yet, it's in the library as well as that hallway leading into the library. And we're going to, to have a little reception there afterwards. So if you haven't seen it yet, feel free to come by after and take a look then. Okay, so I, I've been to a lot of artist talks um, and I went to, I had a, quite a few in undergrad and I remember wishing that uh, I, I got the full story. Uh, I remember a lot of times artists would come and just kind of talk about what they were doing now and the success that was happening. And it was exciting, but also a little um, discouraging at the same time because I was not in that place. Um, so my goal is to kind of take you through everything from the beginning up until now and uh, just kind of show you how how I have grown, how my art has grown, how some of my concepts have grown, you know, going back to undergrad to now, um, and just maybe what I'm planning on doing going further. All right, so I wanted to start with talking about some of my undergraduate work. Um, I went to Elmhurst University. It was Elmhurst College when I was there, but they changed their name. Um, and I studied I, I studied graphic design. I was originally a nonprofit major and art major, and I was required to take a graphic design course. Um, and I just immediately fell in love with it. One course was enough. I was obsessed with the fine detail and the attention to detail. I'm a very particular person and it fit my personality very well. I loved that there were rules to graphic design. And then I also loved that I was able to break those rules. So uh, all that together um, was enough for me to pursue it full time. So when I was at, in undergrad, we did all the normal stuff, stuff you're doing now, right? We did uh, logo design, identity branding. We did publications, illustration, all of that great stuff. And it was all really directed to uh, a client, right? So we were working as we would work in the field. Um, and it wasn't until my senior, my senior year where that kind of changed. Um, I, we, we did our senior thesis. So essentially you have half of a semester, or you have one semester to work on a 
thesis that will go into the thesis show, um, which is really a cool opportunity, right? You get to kind of do whatever you want to do, and it's very, very open-ended. So this was the first time where I started to kind of break away from some of that traditional design. So for my senior thesis, I decided I was also very into packaging design. I still am. I thought for sure I was going to be a packaging designer, and then I changed my mind. So we'll get there. Um, so I decided to do a whole series of packaging design, but I was trying to come up with what the packages would be. So I, I settled on creating a, a timeline of physical, actual packages that all reflected like important moments in my life, right? So I, I wrote down all these notes. I literally just started writing about everything that came to my mind that stood out. I did interviews. I asked friends and family, like, what moments, you know, do you remember from my childhood or middle school or high school that, you know, kind of stood out to you? And I went down, I narrowed it down. I think I did it to every other year. I highlighted a moment and I made an actual package for that, that year. So I'm only going to, to show a few here, um, but let's start with my first and maybe my favorite, which is Naked Dolly. <laughs> yeah, so this is, uh, that's my actual doll that I had as a kid uh, and I lost her clothes. So I named her Naked Dolly. She was forever Naked Dolly. She never wore clothes. Um, so I decided that was really, really an important uh, part of it when, when I was developing as a, as a young child. So I designed this packaging um, and I gave her the name Naked Dolly instead of whatever the official name was that, that she was called. I threw all her clothes in the back, right? And she doesn't need the clothes. Um, and then I designed this entire uh, package to go with it. Uh, here's some close-ups. The back is this picture of my sister and I holding the doll, again, with no clothes. Um, she was one of those dolls where you would like give her water and she would pee it out, <laughs> which I thought was awesome. So I did a little bath time theme because you would, you would play with her in the bath because of the, the water aspect. Um, moving on, I did this piece called Sista Sista Malos. Uh, this is um, also probably elementary school. And my sister and I, who are still very close, had a secret club. We were the Sista Sista Club um, based off of that that show sister sister right um so we would sit in our basement and take forks and put apples on them and make fake campfires and like sing campfire songs so i designed a packaging to reflect that which was actual marshmallows um it's kind of cheesy the purple and yellow i'm violet she's amber right uh just kind of playing into that on the back every little detail i could i tried to relate to something personal um, even down to like dates, you know, reflected certain things, um, which not everyone would understand, but that's okay. I, I really enjoyed it. And then we get a little, a, a little more intense. So I, I moved on to essentially middle school, right? So in middle school, a lot of your ideas start to form. You start to kind of become who you are, right? And you start to have these, these, this belief system. And, you know, when you're younger, my belief was that I loved my doll. That was my only my only belief, right? Um, but as you get older, you start to, you know, develop these things. And in middle school is when I, I first get it, start getting involved in the church and I became very religious, right? So I made these um, different uh, like kitchen wear, not kitchen wear, kitchen bottles and packaging that related to some of these statements that at that time I found to be true, right? Um, so move on to a few other ones that I have here. Again, they were very dramatic, like matter of fact, because that's what middle school was, right? When I thought something, I was like, this is the only way that it can be. And then I move into a piece for uh, more like I would say high school. Um, and this is when I start to maybe question some of those things, right? So again, I'm trying to show this whole journey. Um, and at this point, I'm starting to go, oh, maybe I don't, maybe I don't believe in all of these things, right? Maybe that isn't actually how I see the world. Um, so I created these doubt badges and each badge uh, reflected something that I was starting to question or maybe change my viewpoints on, right? Moving away from certain things. Um, and at this time I, I would go to Camp Awana, which is a religious camp and you would win badges for like memorizing verses and things. So I kind of played on that and did the opposite by making doubt badges by saying you'd be rewarded with a badge by questioning something that you learned earlier on.
All right, so um, again, this was really the first time where I started to combine this more personal and conceptual idea into design, moving away from some traditional design and making it more about personal expression. Uh, so that was that was really great for me. After that, I uh, graduated and I started working as a designer. I was primarily hired as an illustrator. It just happened that that was the first job that I got and I liked it. And my portfolio was mostly illustration. So I kept getting illustrator jobs. And even to this day, most of my freelancing um, is illustration based. Uh, but I, it wasn't long until I realized I, I, wasn't, I wasn't done with school, right? I wasn't done learning. Um, I'd only kind of touched the surface I also thought maybe I was thinking about teaching, you know, what I wanted to do down the road. Uh, so I decided to go to graduate school. I went to Cranbrook Academy of Arts um, and my entire process drastically changed by entering this environment. So I was in the 2D department, which is a graphic design department, but it was situated within a graduate art program. So the way that things were seen it's very different than my uh, traditional undergrad experience. Um, so I'm gonna start with showing you some of the design work that I did there. Uh, these are GIFs and they kind of move kind of fast. So I'm sorry about that, be warned. I'm not compulsively clicking left and right. So a lot of my work was very type heavy at this time. I'm still uh, really into typography. And I, again, I was trying to try these more uh, experimental ways of playing with type. I was also, be, I was getting a lot more tactile, right? So I was moving away from the screen. I was doing risograph prints and screen printing and seeing how I could take my designs into something that I could touch and I could feel. Just a few other ones. Oops. Okay, so again, this is when, I'm sorry, when I started to think about how different mediums could come together. Um, and I was starting to think about painting at this point. Uh, I hadn't started painting yet, but I was, it was on my mind, right? Different mediums. And um, I, I'm a firm believer that there's all these different mediums, right? We have design, we have painting, we have drawing, we have ceramics, we have fibers, but they're all just mediums right, to create something. And sometimes I think there's this kind of bizarre gap between graphic design and the arts. And that's just, it's really not fair. Um, and it's not a, I don't think it's the best way to look at design, it, it really limits it. Um, so I uh, took it upon myself to try to think, you know, more openly about what design was. And attending a, an art school made that a lot easier, right? There were a, a lot of people that encouraged that um, and it made it possible. Uh, there's also this, this, there's a lot of theories about graphic design um, that I studied. And there's this theory that, you know, design, the goal of design is to combine aesthetics and function together. So people will argue that it's no longer fine arts because of this, this element of functionality. Um, but to me, I mean, I just disregarded that altogether because the functionality of it being fine arts is that self-expression, right? That is a function in its own. It doesn't also have to function as an advertisement, right? Or a chair that you sit in. Uh, so I started painting after this. Uh, the reason I started painting was one, uh, I just wanted to start painting, right? I was, I was like, that sounds fun. And I, I liked painting in high school. I wanted to give it a try again. I actually was assigned my first critique and I didn't know what to do. And my studio mate just said, why don't you paint something? And I was like, okay, right? So it was, I just kind of fell into it. Again, I never, I was in the graphic design department. So I didn't formally study painting at all. It's all through the lens of graphic design. You can come in. <laughs> um, I also wanted to create work that had a more of a personal touch and a personal narrative and story. And I wanted to be doing something where I had to actually work with the piece hands on to create that literal personal touch that I could be more invested into the work by creating that, by removing that distance from screen to person, it was able, I was able to create something that was more kind of intimate. 
So early on, uh, I started making these oil paintings of uh, kind of abstract forms. And I think the reason when I'm looking back that I started with these or that th this was the first time I had painted with a knowing anything about design. And I think I was trying to explore how to use my understanding of design and the just fundamentals of design in a different medium. Um, so I'm really focusing, you know, on form and shape and taking that background from undergrad and applying it to something new. So I worked on these and I, I kind of quickly got bored. Um, I, I didn't really feel a, a connection to them. And I wanted to start making work about things that I, I cared about and that I wanted to share with the world. And uh, at this time, and I, I still am, I was a, I was a vegan, right? And uh, especially then I was really, I was very passionate about animal rights. I still am, but I was like gung-ho, right? So I decided to start there. It was something I cared about. So I, oh, sorry, these works in progress. I started making these dairy works, right? These paintings that talked about the dairy industry. It was my really uh, intense artist statement. I teach color theory, so I should have known not to do this. But I, at this point, I'm talking about really kind of, I'm using a lot of big language, right? So I'm talking about, um, you know, the dairy industry through commercialism and the mass media, right? So I'm throwing out these hefty words and I'm creating these kind of whimsical paintings. A lot of them play on puns, uh, puns about the dairy industry. Uh, this is butter would it melt in his mouth. It means you're a really cold person. Um, this one is one of my favorites because it's titled Your Ass Sucks Buttermilk which was a saying my grandfather always said. And I don't know, we don't know where it came from. I've looked on the internet, no one knows. But he would get mad and you know, your ass sucks buttermilk. And I was like, well, that's, that has to be included. It's <laughs> duh. So I went ahead and I made this piece. I uh, have the milk of human kindness. Some detail shots here. Uh, when I'm, when I first started painting, with acrylic, I had this idea in my head that I wanted everything to be very matte and very clean and look like a print. Um, and I kind of quickly, thankfully got myself out of that mindset where I realized that there's actually a lot of beauty in the fact that it's a painting, right? So those little mistakes show that it is not a printed piece. So when you get close up to work, you know, you can see um, paint strokes or you can see that that lift that happens when you remove tape and it elevates from the panel. Uh, you can see pieces of dust that were in the air when I was painting, right? And those little things actually become really kind of beautiful on their own. Again, it shows that personal vested, in vested interest into the piece that doesn't happen when you just, when we print digitally. Okay, oh, this is Milk It For All It's Worth. Right before I hop into some of my newer work, I want to talk a bit about my process. Um, so again, I uh, combine graphic design and painting together, and I do this mostly through vectors. Right, so I uh, I design everything um, in these these line line drawings that are done on Illustrator. I am much better at the pen tool than an actual pen. So I prefer to work that way. And the beauty of working in vectors is that essentially your illustrations become versatile. You can do so many things. Um, I actually started a little earlier. If you look at these oil paintings, I started with these shapes that I designed and then I CNC cut them, right? So I was able to have these cut out of wood because it was a vector that I had designed. Um, and then I started taking it, you know, a step step farther. Um, and it really comes through in the use of vinyl. So I'm using a lot of vinyl almost as a stencil to, to make everything really kind of perfect and clean. So if you look at this image here, you see all those little like blue pieces? Those are essentially little stickers, right? So I'm painting one layer, 
placing this vinyl on top, painting another layer, and then I can remove that vinyl and it will show those that pattern. This is a piece that is actually in the gallery. This piece is called Who Knows? And I have a, a little process video here to show you how I made this piece. This is one of my attempts at TikTok. I don't know how to turn the volume off, so. Okay, so I'm putting layers on, right? So I'm painting layers. I'm doing a lot of sanding in between to get everything really smooth. I'm applying more vinyl, I'm adding tape. I'm sanding, I'm going back and adding new things that I forgot about, having them cut out this entire process. Just keeps going. Have to do the hair. And there it is. Okay, so I had been working on those dairy pieces for quite a while. Um, all, all, of the, all of my work is fairly new. I haven't been painting in a very long time, but these were uh, some of the earlier works that were all kind of started in grad school. And then as I kept going, these dairy symbols kind of transformed on their own. And it was a very beautiful process. I am a overthinker. I am a planner. So when I was working on these, and I come from a design background where you plan everything out, right? You, you're going back to the client brief. So I was doing research. I was writing thesis statements and all my work was backed up to that statement. That's how I was thinking about painting. And I started to get away from that, not intentionally, but the work just started to transform on its own without me necessarily specifically thinking about it, right? It was obviously happening in my head, but I wasn't writing statements and researching it. And these different dairy symbols turned into, you know, symbols for things like uh, women's rights, my experience as a woman, uh, labor, um, uh, sex, and uh, beauty as a whole, and all these things that were on my mind at that time. But I wasn't, I didn't really realize we're starting to come through. So it started kind of slowly and they eventually became something of their own. Um, so these are some of the, the bigger works that I started on. So this piece is uh, drink milk or your arms will fall off. This is also in the library. And this piece, I'm still like, oh, I'm doing a dairy theory. I'm doing dairy here. But uh, I started to incorporate, you know, these elements of uh, women who are kind of distorted and torn apart, um, as well as uh, breasts. Now they're just kind of like sexualized images, right? That started to play a role. No detail shot. This piece is called Soy Boy. It is also up in gallery. I love this picture because you can start to see how those lines overlap in the finger, right? It's not perfectly flat. Um, you're starting to see that it's actually done by hand. This piece is open for business. Me moo. So I'm playing with milk, but it's really starting to get less and less about the milk as they go through. All right, yeah, I can pick up on that. Um, this is a nothing but hair. Fractured smiles. Okay, uh, so that was where the work kind of went after this whole this whole dairy thing, right? Um, I think when I realized maybe the dairy idea was over was I was in a show. Someone came up to me and went, oh, you're that dairy person. And I was like, oh no, <laughs> I think I need, a new, I need a new subject. This is getting a little out of control. Um, so now I went to talk a bit about my newer work. Um, so I have a, some work out there that's very, very new. So in the hallway leading up to the library is the newest series of work. And these are all done past year, or really almost the past six months, right? They're very, very recent. Um, and they changed dramatically from what I was doing before. 
Um, to start with, they 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 got a lot smaller, uh, right? So I was working really big. The other ones here, they're like four or five feet. They're massive. And I started getting to these really small works. And when I mean small works, I mean, I made some small little works, right? So for me, I, had, I was very out of my element. Um, but I, I really enjoy working on these because it changed the way that I interacted with the panel, right? The canvas, all of a sudden it became a lot more intimate, a lot more personal. And the work that I started to make was a lot more personal. I started to move away some, from some of these basically larger words or larger concepts that I would use to describe my art, right? Um, and started to make work that, that was very much rooted in my experience or, or how I was seeing the world at that time. Um, and it was, it was wonderful. It felt uh, very liberating to get to this point where I didn't feel this pressure to make it about something else. And it, it took me a very long time to realize up until very recently that you creating personal work doesn't necessarily create a barrier for you and your viewer, right? Before I was trying to do these big concepts where everyone could, everyone could get it, right? But I started to realize by making these that by creating work that was very much tied into who you are and your experience, other people would relate to that experience. And it would kind of create this, this like emotional connection between you and another person. And one of my favorite examples of this is for this piece called Who Knows? So uh, this is, for this piece, it's one of the first times I started to play around with gender in my work and kind of questioning what gender means. And um, I had a lot of positive reaction to this one, but the most important interaction that I had and I may ever have was the interaction that I had with my sister over this piece, right? Uh, so she, she was very emotionally connected to this piece, right? It meant a lot to her. Um, so much that she went ahead, she wrote this beautiful poem about it. She's a writer. Um, and it, it really kind of brought us closer together because there were some things that maybe we never talked about before and we didn't know how to talk about that all opened up over one, one painting. Um, so I wanted to read part of the poem. I'm not going to read the whole thing. It's a very long poem. If you would like it, I can, I can give it to you. I did get permission. She said it was all right if I read this. Um, so I'm going to do my best here to not butcher it. So this was when the piece was hanging um, in a gallery called Jackson Young and it's actually like a block away from her apartment. So she would walk past it a lot and see this piece. So she writes, there's a piece on the southeast corner of the gallery. It's a new painting of a person, poised somewhere between relaxation and anticipation. In subdued earthy tones, the imperfect circles of their nipples and the waves of their thick pubic hairs all situated exactly so that rather than gender, you see a pop art illustration of softness. The kind of softness that wins wars. And I don't mean wars of stealing young men and dressing them in artillery, but the kind of wars fought with dad at an evening barbecue. The kind of wars fought by 15 year olds in their biology classrooms. It is in the same softness where I attempt to recognize my gender. And it is in this painting where the nuance and complexity of this question is somehow honored, if not celebrated per se. This softness is at least defined in so much as it declares it is not willing to be. And the artist walks into the gallery and I say, so good to meet you. And I shake her hand, just kidding, I'm lying about that part. What I really do is throw my arms around her and say, hi, Violet, it looks great, this is awesome. You see, Violet is the artist and Violet is my sister. And I take a breath in a world where in those subtle ways, I am my sister and my sister is me in a world where I may not always know myself. So that was her poem. I could cry, it's beautiful. Uh, I did not write that. So all that to say that what's happening with these, this more personal work are these connections that I never got before with any of my other work. Um, and starting to talk about things that 
that just didn't come up previously. And it hasn't only happened in this time, this situation has happened since then. Actually, it's happened here on campus quite a bit as this is one of the first times I've shown all these works. And um, I've had some really kind of beautiful conversations over it. And I, uh, we, I've had conversations about things that maybe are usually uncomfortable to talk about, especially in a workplace environment, um, talking about things like gender and sexuality and um, kind of sharing personal stories. I've had a lot of conversations that are, that are very kind of deep and meaningful that you just don't normally have at work, right? You, it's small talk normally. It's hard to get to this stuff. And I mean, people I didn't even know. And it, it was just, these moments are so, so incredibly worth everything. Um, so it also has kind of validated me in that this is maybe the right path, right? That I should continue to create more of this deeply personal work instead of maybe this theory-driven, um, I don't know, uh, I don't want to say academic, but it's it's somewhere, you know, it's it's removed from it's talking about the issues, but removing the personal, right? So focusing more on that personal element. Um, so if any of you are the ones who talk to me, thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right. So for this last little bit here, I just want to talk about what's next, uh, what I have, what I'm thinking about right now. So the most recent thing I've really been focused on is this idea of interaction. Um, I, both viewers interacting with, with the work, myself interacting with the work, um, trying to remove maybe some of this, you know, painting, white wall gallery experience um, into something more. So this one is in the gallery. This is one of the first pieces where I really played with this. So this is a really big piece, heavy. Trevor and Matt put it up so they can attest to that. Um, and you're invited to open and close the doors and interact with this piece. Uh, so this is again, the, the very first time that I tried doing this. I'm sorry about the volume. So that was the first one that I really started to play with. Um, I do this thing a lot where I should do experiments and test things and I don't, I just go for it. So I didn't have any little ones made. I was like, I'm gonna make this big door piece. Thankfully it worked out, right? Um, it, there were some, some things that had to be redone, um, but this was my first time really playing with this, right? And it was uh, kind of playing with the shock value, right? This idea that something closed and the reward that the viewer gets by actually participating in the piece, right? You get something from it. And then I was also playing around with how I interact with the work, right? So not just how someone else is, but my, my uh, experience creating. So I, this is a very new piece. I just, just did it. I've never tried anything really sculptural before. Um, but hey, why not, you know, try something new. So this was a very fun piece because I was working with plaster, which meant I was very uh, kind of gross and messy and gooey and hands-on, right? Um, so this first picture is me playing where I would want my hands to go on this piece. This is me making some kind of contraption to mold around this thing. <laughs> um, and here I am actually, you know, putting my hand in, feeling the material and literally becoming part of the piece, right? Because the hand looks just like my hand, it is my hand. Um, kind of playing around with where these pieces should go. All of these things that I had never tried before because I was, you know, working in this very specific way of these, these paintings. So that was, that was a lot of fun. Um, and hopefully I'll, I'll do some more of these where I'm, where I'm interacting with the work. Uh, I've also, I also created a mural this is my first mural I've ever created. It was for a uh, not uh, fundraising event. It was for a fundraising event. And it was the first piece where A, uh, it was, you had to be there to experience it, right? Uh, this piece only exists in one place. 
In fact, it doesn't exist at all anymore. If you go there, it's been painted over. There's something new. So you were only able to see it for, you know, a certain amount of time and you had to physically go there and be kind of part of this piece. And then to continue playing with interaction, this globe in the middle, it's a snow globe, um, is actually a canvas. So it actually removes from the wall. So this was a fundraising event. So someone could interact with this piece, purchase this piece and actually remove it and take part of it home with them, um, which was really another kind of fun way to play with that. And then I have my puppet. So if you've been to the library, you've probably already seen it, but I decided one day I wanted to make a puppet. Um, why? Because I had a puppet when I was a kid. My sister and I had these ballerinas. They're actually ornaments made out of, I wanna say like tin or aluminum. And you would pull the string and it would go up. And we thought it was funny because we thought it was like a tampon. So we called it the tampon girl. And every Christmas we get all excited when tampon girls came out and we were able to hang them on the tree. Um, so I was thinking about this, you know, interaction and, and, and play, and I couldn't help but think of this puppet. So I decided to design a puppet. This is not the puppet. This was the first attempt at drawing a puppet. She did not come to life. Um, she was the first idea. And then I started playing uh, with paper to test some of these out. It's very confusing how to tie it all together. The noise is my favorite part. Um, after that, I went ahead and I made some vectors, right? And I had these uh, laser cut out. I <laughs> then had all her little body parts laid across this little contraption I made so that I could paint each body part separately. And then this is the final result. I named this piece Sue Ellen, which is after Sue Ellen Ro Roca. If any of you have heard of her, she's a, she, she was a Chicago imagist and part of the Harry Who and a very close mentor and friend. Um, and this is very much done in the style of the Chicago imagist. So they are a major influence in my practice. They always have been, even when I was just designing. Um, and I, you know, created this character and to reference her. Um, uh, I was also just drawn, drawn to the images because they, they weren't designers, they were painters, but their work looks like design. It, it reads as graphic design, except it's doing the opposite of graphic design or it's critiquing everything that's happening in advertising. So that was a lot of fun. Oops. All right. And then that's about it for this. What I'm doing next is I am uh, doing like a few different things, right? We're never really just doing one thing. Um, I have more of these small paintings that I am pursuing, um, which I, again, I'm just trying to let myself create um, and create work that somehow is, is helping me in that moment. Um, and I'm also continuing to play with this interaction. I I'm working on some other wooden toys. So the idea is to create many wooden toys, not just puppets, different kinds. And I have a, a show coming up in May. So it's not a lot of time, but hopefully it will be done. And you, as the viewer, be invited into this room full of these toys, these weird, odd, surreal toys. And you would be able to play with all of them. Um, my other goal is to make a giant puppet. And you step on the pedal and it. So that's that's also in the works. But if anyone knows how to make a giant puppet, please come talk to me because there are some logistical questions. All right, and that is uh, everything I have prepared, but I absolutely love questions. So if you have questions, please ask me. Um, that's it. Yeah. When you're doing those old ways and you're doing all those 
how long did you did you work on this? Say that you know this point in your career when you went there. Um it's a good question. It definitely changes based on the piece. Um, I would say it actually probably takes more time coming up with what I want to paint. I'm spending a lot more time drawing uh, than I am painting, which does say a lot because the painting takes a long time as well. Um, it really, the painting part depends on how much detail there is, right? Um, some of them that are more simpler don't take as much time, but the again, the brainstorming takes just as much time and it seems to almost take more time every time I do it because I'm always trying to reach for something else and sometimes I feel like there's just nothing left to come up with, right? So um, it's also the least fun for me. I, I hate it. So I, I understand when I make y'all do sketches, sucks, I know, but this is what I do too. And you gotta push through it because then as you know, when you actually work on it, um, that part is really rewarding and it all comes together. So I don't know if I really have a time frame for you. Um, sorry. <laughs> huh? Uh, the bigger ones take months. Yeah, they take a very long time. Uh, the one with the doors took, I don't know, at least six months, maybe longer. Um, you know, the puppet took a while because I don't know how to make a puppet. You know, uh, some were quick, the hand with the plaster, it was for a show and I was asked to be in the show and I had seven days to make it. So I made it in seven days. Um, and I just hoped it all worked out. Thankfully, some wonderful people here in the art department helped me figure out how you would hear plaster and wood because apparently that's a no-go. And I didn't know that, I just made it. Um, so that one was quick because it had to be quick. Um, yeah. Hope that gives gives some insight into it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, please. Project management. Yeah, I mean, it's they're all t like time specific and series specific, right? So. I'm a big fan of working in a series because it really helps with brainstorming, right? It gives you somewhere to continually go off of and start of starting all over. Um, so the dairy part was easier. I was playing off of that. And then these, these newer pieces, I was really focused on the human body, um, especially like play and playing with certain themes. So like I was playing with gender a lot in them. So that was able, something I was able to carry over. Um, some of them just stylistically are very similar, right? I start to develop a style that I like for that series, which makes it easier. And a lot of it is just like what I'm inspired by at that time, right? So it's giving me something to work off of by looking at, at other work and other artists that I that I value. And that kind of helps me come up with some ideas, but there's like no magic solution to coming up with ideas. You just suffer through it until something comes. <laughs> Yeah. How did you know that you really wanted the first two parts? Yeah. Um it was a pretty obvious choice. Um I would say the most difficult choice was that I was really stuck in this mindset of design and art. And I thought I had a pick, and that stressed the hell out of me because I wanted to do both. Um, I thought I had to either go work for a packaging design company or not eat and make paintings. You know, I didn't think that there was any in between. And it was actually specifically Sue Ellen Roca, who was the one who she was mentoring me and I was showing her some work. And I was talking about this challenge and she just looked at me and she's like, what's, why does it matter? Like, just make what you want to make you, you're a creative person, you're an artist, it all fits together. Um, and it's wild how much that that helped me because I was in school. I'm like, well, my portfolio has to be for one thing. Is my portfolio to be in a gallery? Is my portfolio to get a job? And I just didn't know what to do um, until I finally realized you don't have to choose. You can do it all. You can wear a lot of different hats. Um, I knew I, I, I mean, I started painting and I just loved the process of it. So that was an easy choice. Um, and, you know, when I started undergrad, I was, I was pursuing some sort of art, but it was more, more business focused. Um, but I, you know, I did 
kind of followed the path. I did art in high school, right? And then I got to college and I was like, I'm an art kid. I was, that's, those are the people I know. So I, I went there. Um, and then, yeah, it's just trying a new class that got me into it. So try new classes. Yes, Matt. Uh, kind of a technical question. When you're using the uh, the vinyl, mm -hmm. do you use a master recorder as well? Yes, I use GAC 200. <laughs> Write that down. It's it's game changing. Yes, it uh it will it keeps everything nice and clean. Stops your bleed your paint from bleeding underneath. Use a lot of frog tape. Great stuff. Um. But yes, I did not know about the magical medium for a very long time. And then I got it and I was like, man, the time I wasted. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, Trevor? So in your process for the age, you showed that you kind of kept going back. So you went back and you knew that bird and like deep in that vinyl. Did that commonly you go back and see more of that bird? Or did you try to do much of it the first time and kind of get in there to do the vision back? it's it's very so dramatically some look identical to the sketch that I made and some you would never recognize the sketch um sometimes I realize things aren't working as I'm doing them or a lot of times I'm just like I want more so a lot of times I go back to that detail you know I'm like oh this needs a new pattern it needs something to bring this area to life um so that happens a lot but yeah some are the same I would say the main thing that I don't do is I don't play with color ahead of time so that's all done just like in the moment right i'm just there i'm playing with colors and kind of making it up as i go along because when you work digitally it does not translate really to paint so it's it's nice to keep those separate <laughs> yeah so for your mural how would you appeal because we talked about how all these you're trying to plug in a connection between two people in your particular artwork, right? So if the mural is something that is the story, basically, do you like the aspect of as long as it's done so you have to physically go there and make that connection to the building, the place, and it's drawn? Or are you kind of bummed out that now and like it right away? Um, you know, I I loved making the mural. And I think I did enjoy the fact that it wasn't going to last forever just because it's not, it was hard for me. And I think it was good that it was hard for me, right? So learning that you can let go of things that sometimes things do have a time and a place, right? And the time and the place was was when it was up and people were inter interacting with it then. Um, and then it's time was over, right? Not everything lasts forever. I, I've also enjoyed that in that, uh, like this puppet and, um, other things like they start to wear and tear with more use. And I love that, right? The handlebars get fingerprints on them. That's awesome. Uh, so, I mean, I love all of that. And the, the mural was hard that it wouldn't last forever, but it, it's also kind of liberating when you're working at it because you're like, I don't know, it gives you like a different sense of freedom. Um, it also had a different purpose. Like you can't, you don't buy a mural, right? So it wasn't for that. It was for this, this thing that was happening then. Um, that one was also interesting because I was still trying to, I was trying to incorporate my style and my message within the theme of the fundraiser. So it was Crystal Ball was the name of the event. So I was trying to incorporate that without losing, you know, what I wanted to do. But yeah, it's sad. It's gone. Isaac? Yeah. Um, well, I can tell you that I don't do them by hand. Uh, so I can't compare a whole lot because I only do it one way. Um, I like working digitally because it's fast and you can move things around a lot. So I can make like, you know, one idea and 12 different ideas of how that's laid out within minutes, right? Versus redrawing everything. And, you know, I think a lot of it is also, I didn't study art until my freshman year in undergrad. And that was with design. So I learned everything about art with like a trackpad. And I, I mean, I'm like the 
most designers would hate me because I don't even work on like a big trackpad or a mouse. Like I do that little trackpad and make all of my, my stuff, but it's how I, what I enjoy doing, you know? Um, I mean, if any of you have worked with it, you know that the pen tool is, is hard to learn and it works differently than a pencil. So you're actually kind of learning a different language. Um, yeah, I don't really sketch a whole lot by hand. Um, sometimes like really quick things, you know, if it's just like trying to figure out where some things go. Um, they mostly work digitally. So you could probably answer that better than I could. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. I I think they have progressively been uh, connected better with people as they've as they've grown, and I think that's also just because I'm growing as an artist, right? So when you're early on I, didn't, I just didn't know what I was doing I still don't fully know what I'm doing that's okay right but I you just start to I guess learn about these things and also I think learn putting less pressure on that and making more work for yourself actually makes those uh that reaction a lot stronger um but they've definitely I've seen a shift on them getting more and more um personal with people and just more uh more of these like deeper conversations um yeah it's been good it's been positive I haven't had anyone yell at me for not painting cows so <laughs> yeah Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Right. <laughs> um, but it's, it's maybe not quite what you think. So, um, I, I don't get nervous about people not, not maybe having different beliefs and not liking it. Right. Because I think that's exciting. Right. And that's where some of those conversations come from. Um, there have been some people on campus who don't like it. That's awesome. Right. Some of the things that have happened have been really cool because of that. What I do get fearful of is, you know, uh, not being aware of how my work translates to every translates to everyone and um hurting hurting someone right that's not i don't want but it's it's almost impossible when you put something out into the world it's really it's almost it's i don't know if it is possible to have no negative impact right you're just hoping the positive outweighs the negative um especially though when i start to question things that i do care about i don't want yeah i don't want people to feel like disheartened by it and that is scary, right? That's like my biggest fear. Uh, sometimes I have that question all the time. I'm like, am I, you know, am I helping? This sounds really cheesy and over the top. I know I'm not controlling the world, but am I helping the world or am I making it worse, right? You, it's And it's important to think about that. And sometimes I don't have the answer. Um, and I think it's just something you struggle with as an artist. But again, I, there are people who who maybe dislike things. And I think it's, a great conversation opener, but I, it's a difference with disliking or being unpleased by something than being hurt by something, you know, and that's just, you know, it, it's hard when you're one person with one viewpoint, right? Um, so I think sharing your work with a lot of people and getting reactions and people maybe in your circle too, like people who can give you honest feedback and, you know, that exposure before maybe you put it out to the whole world, it's like a responsible thing to do. That was a great question. Good question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, I really like all of your questions. Um, yeah, so much. It, it's a, almost amazing how much that's happened. Um, where I'm like, wow, I'm literally learning about myself, or or I come to a realization. I'm like, man, someone could have guessed that basing on based on the work, but I didn't realize I thought that way. Right, all these different things, and yeah, it's. I think it's part of that process of just like making these works without this, just in the moment, and then you don't even realize why you're doing it or you think you're doing it for a different reason and then you know uh, a few a year passes and and you look back and someone says something to you and you go wow I actually like someone will say something and they'll be like well do you think this way and I'm like actually I think I do right or I think I do see that and I didn't realize that until someone else said it about that work um but yeah that that definitely happens Yeah. So my question is, um, as an artist, how do you protect yourself? Because like there is a point, like I've experienced this in class where you get into like a, um your comfort zone and you just like start producing work that's just very similar. Um, and you don't, or like, sometimes you, like, you throw yourself away, and then, like, when you feel like you're sort of growing out of it, it's, like, scary to get out of that comfort. So, like, what would be your advice to, like, think to do, like, how do one push themselves out of, uh, that, you know, and face that fear? I think at a certain point, you just get bored. That's at least what happens to me. After a while, I'm just, I, for, I was, like, doing the, the, even these paintings that I was, I was happy with or the other ones I was, after I was painting so long, I was just, I didn't want to go to the studio. I was so bored of painting. So I was like, I'm going to make a puppet, right? Like that sounds fun. Doing things for the sake of fun is really great. Right. Or the idea that, yeah, I've never painted a mural, but like, that sounds cool. I'll figure it out. Um, doing, I think doing stuff just because you think it'll be joyful is a good way to do it. Um, it's also nice to do things that are low pressure. Like I took a ceramics class and I don't know anything about ceramics. And since it was so distant from my practice, I didn't feel like I had to be good at it, right? I could just try it and learn something new. Um, like I was trying woodworking over the summer. Well, I don't know how to woodwork. So if I, my chair falls over, no one expected it to be a beautiful chair, right? Um, but even other things, I think it's just, I don't, I don't know. I just, I really do get bored. I I think I was telling some of you in class that I I just finished, I was doing a, like a whiskey label and I was just like, I don't want to sit in the computer. So I, I lino cut it and like made essentially like little stamps. Uh, I've never done that before. I don't know. Um, but it was fine. Uh, and I maybe do this in a way you shouldn't do it where I do it on timelines uh, where I don't have a choice. So I had to do this little sculpture in seven days. And I was like, I'm going to use all this stuff that might not work because it has to get done. And it, I, I always get it done, right? Uh, I was like, I make this mural. I have like six weeks to make a mural. So there's going to be a mural. Um, so because if you don't have that, it's so much easier to like be like, ah, and stop, right? Or not, like one thing doesn't go right and you go back to your thing. Um, so having those deadlines is kind of great. I'm a big fan of deadlines overall. Um, I just do it for fun. Do fun stuff. Take more classes. It's fun. Yeah, I agree. Uh, it's kind of like a little question that we're getting towards the next year's personal stuff. No. Um, how did you got into that? Like, do you think that out or did they teach you that? Yeah. Uh, it's like an impossible world to get into and like very much gate, you know, everyone keeps secrets and it's it's really not great right it's not a it's not a good scene it's a bad scene but it's also you know we want to do it we want money we want to sell some stuff um uh yeah I it was easy when I so I was living in Detroit for graduate school and it was easy there because I went to a known graduate program right so people would come to your shows and people would look on you know they would know who was it's a small cohort right there were 150 of total in the whole school, right? So it was it was easy to be sought after there. But then when I moved back to Chicago, it was a whole different world um, because 
no one cares about what's happening in Detroit anymore, right? Uh, Chicago has its own circle. Um, and the way that I actually got into it, I was just I was very, very lucky. I joined a residency and I met wonderful people. Uh, and they were everything I wanted in grad school that I didn't get. So grad school was like toxic and mean and everyone is out to get each other. And then I went to this residency and everyone was like, let's support each other and help each other. And I had people taking me to shows and help, like introducing me to people, right? Uh, and um, so that was a wonderful way to get plugged in was just by having a community that would that would help. I don't know how people do it without having like a community to to rely on. I I don't see how you get into it. People do. I just don't know the answer. And then it's going to a lot, right? So I go to everything. I also enjoy it. It's fun. And that's where my friends are. But I, I every weekend, I'm, you know, at an opening or or doing something related to arts or design. Um, and yeah, if you don't enjoy it, you probably won't do it every weekend. I do it because it's fun, but it's also, it's it's funny. It's like you're, you're, my version of going out but it's also like my career at the same time right so it's kind of a funny mix um but my advice is just to like find people and a lot of them are people in school that was so much of my community and still so I, I i know i drive you all nuts but in class i'm like you all should be friends right because that's the people those are the people who will help you long term um and who will be there for you so take advantage of it you literally have a community right here um yeah, and then you leave school and it's, you know, it's harder. So it's good to have some people to have your back. Ooh, one more, apparently. Okay. It's going to sound a little overly funny, but I love, love, love the idea of doubt badges. <laughs> They're so brilliant. Uh, and in the, in the context of like a deep religious commitment, a moment of doubt can be personally unbalancing and, and sort of feel like an existential crisis. And I love the idea of kind of subverting that and making it a moment to celebrate. But I'm also thinking that some moments of doubt come to us not so much in moments of crisis, but just in, in like these strange sort of academic ways, like, you know, Cartesian radical doubt is just as like a strange philosophical puzzle, like uh, how do we know anything is real or something like that. Mm -hmm. And that's not sort of as personal and exciting as maybe a religious doubt might be. And sometimes doubt comes to us in, in, in the form of like wonder. So it's kind of like a moment of celebration and like curiosity. So I was thinking about the four badges on that array that you had. And the one on the right had like a, it looked like a, like an iceberg or something and like a big monster coming underneath and like biting it. I don't know if I'm reading it the right way or what. And I, I'm wondering if there's a way to sort of repurpose the different badges and different forms of doubt. Is that is that a big fish under the water that's biting something? There's no fish. <laughs> but I'm glad you're I'm glad you're seeing a fish. <laughs> I prefer a fish. Oh, it's roads in a mountain. I should have done a fish. <laughs> I, think I think there's a fish boat to be there. Uh huh. <laughs> that could be mine. I like it. Yeah, for me, it was definitely a more of a like a terrifying experience because it was like I had my identity built at this point, right? Like these yeah. are the things, and then. I was like, well, if I don't, if I no longer can say these things about myself, like, who am I? Yeah. Right. And um, at this point, now I'm in undergrad, I'm, I'm reflecting so I can see it more positively. But in the moment, it's, you know, it's, it's awful when you, you no longer like recognize yourself. Right. Mm -hmm. But there's no fish. Okay. <laughs> make a fish there. Make a fish Should we? Um, we'd like you to uh, join us in the gallery, continue these conversations. Uh, we'd really like to, again, uh, it's so exciting to sort of have, uh, you know, part of the art department talking, uh, sharing their ideas. Uh, we're so happy that you chose to be here, Violet. Uh, one more round of applause for Violet Lee Pratt. Uh,
should all realize how lucky we are. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys.